Hello and welcome to Keep Talking, a community dialogue about mental health. My name is Gay Maxwell, and I'm the manager of the Office of Continuing Education at the Brattleboro Retreat. The Brattleboro Retreat is a 180-year-old psychiatric and addictions treatment hospital in southeastern Vermont, where it serves adults, adolescents, children in a variety of inpatient and outpatient and residential programs. The Brattleboro Retreat provides care and courage when being human hurts. Today I have in my studio, and with great pleasure, I'm going to introduce Kirk Woodring. Kirk Woodring is the Vice President of Quality and Clinical Services at the retreat. Um, he has been at the retreat um, for how many years now, Kirk? Well, gosh, off and on for probably about a dozen years. I right. was a social worker, and then I was uh, Director of Admissions and Outpatient Services, and I came back, uh, gosh, in uh, November of this year, so about four or five months ago. And we're so happy to get you back. Thank you. <laughs> so I have invited Kirk on, and I thank you again for your time, um, to talk about um, a tough subject, to talk about um, suicide, suicidality, and um, how hard that is for um, uh, people and communities to talk about. Right. Um, and my, my impression has always been, and you can tell me if you think I'm off, on this is that there's kind of a myth that if you talk about suicide, if you talk about um, uh, feelings, uh, suicidal feelings, right. that you're more that you're more inclined to make it happen. And what do you think of that? That's that is a myth. Um, you know, the more we talk about suicide, the more that we get suicide into the public awareness realm. Uh, the more likely people are going to be to identify when there are triggers and when there are concerns about suicide, and the more people are going to feel comfortable about talking about their feelings of suicide. Um, you know, suicide is stigmatized, uh, just as most mental illness is, and um, and suicide is, uh, you know, is is much more common now than it ever has been. And so, talking about it doesn't make it happen. Um, talking about it helps it not happen and, uh, and, and, and helps people get the help they need. Would you explain exactly what suicidal ideation means? What's, you, we hear that term, sure. and for a lot of people, that may seem like, what are you talking about? Yeah, suicidal ideation is really having thoughts about suicide. It's having ideas about suicide. And it's not unusual for people to think about suicide from time to time, uh, you know, under stress, under um, incredible challenges that people face, economic situations, uh, maybe people have lost their homes, uh, you know, they're in foreclosure, they've had um, family losses, grief. There are times when people think, I just want to be dead, I just, I'm done. Mm -hmm. um, that is suicidal ideation. But suicidal ideation is uh, sort of on a continuum. There's, there are degrees of suicidal ideation. So passive thoughts about um, wanting to be dead um, is one thing. But having active thoughts about, uh, about killing yourself and how you want to do that, that's much more concerning. Mm -hmm. So if you are a, a, a clinician and you're talking to somebody, if you're, are you more concerned um, if someone has a plan, is that what you're saying? As opposed to, oh, I wish the ground had just sucked me up and I could disappear. Right. I mean, certainly having a plan, having thoughts, ideas about wanting to die, um, having a plan on how you would, um, how would, how you would commit suicide, how would you allow that to happen. Um, those are, you know, that is very concerning. Mm -hmm. Somebody who just says, I just wish I was dead. Um, you know, I'm so tired. I'm you know, that's a concern, and there's probably, you know, um, concern about depression or anhedonia, things that are concerning um, that you can get treatment for um, in, a, in an outpatient setting. Um, but it's when you really, you know, a, a, a patient or an individual has a plan, they've got um, maybe actions that they've taken towards creating that plan, that's when it becomes a, a red flag for us. Mm. Um, could you explain, uh, one of the things that I w wondered in my research is, uh, preparing for this um, interview, is is suicidality a symptom of something else, or is it actually an illness in itself? So suicidality is not an illness in itself. It's, it's really... Uh, it's a symptom of uh, mental illness. It's a symptom of often depression. 
uh, bipolar disorder, it could be a symptom of schizophrenia, um, it could be a symptom of just incredible stress in someone who may not be, um, uh, who may not have a, a pre-occurring mental illness. Um, it, it's, you know, often with substance use, uh, it's um, a symptom of substance use. So someone may become more suicidal if they're abusing substances, uh, their, uh, their judgment is impaired as a result of that, and so they're more likely to act on those thoughts that they wouldn't necessarily have acted on. So it's, it is a symptom, not an illness in and of itself. I see, I see. So perhaps you could talk a little bit about red flags, red flags perhaps for the person themselves mm -hmm. or for family members. Mm -hmm. So a couple of things that are really important to consider. One is a family history of suicide. So mm -hmm. the, um, you know, the prevalence of suicide uh, is greater in families where there has been a, a, a successful suicide um, at some point in time. So uh, brother, sister, mother, father, grandparents, that's always a red flag. Um, and it could be that somebody um, has had a suicide in their family and they'll never be suicidal um, themselves. But there does seem to be some genetic component to suicidality. Uh, I, I think a change, a, a rapid change in someone's clinical status, in someone's presentation, someone who's typically been happy and um, they've been you know, going along well, things are, seem to be going fine, and then they become more and more isolated over time. They stop spending time with friends, they stop um, you know, going and doing things uh, socially. That's a, that's a concern, that would be a trigger, or not a trigger, but a concern um, to be paying attention to, a red flag to be paying attention to. Uh, I think that any kind of self-harming behavior, um, while is not necessarily suicidal in and of itself, can lead towards um, suicidality. What is self-harming behavior? How, how would you describe that? So things like cutting, burning, um, uh, doing things that are... Cutting um, themselves? So cutting themselves, yeah, cutting themselves, burning themselves. Uh, doing things that are very high risk, driving very fast, mm -hmm. um, you know, when that typically would not be something that one would do. Um, taking risks that, uh, that are putting oneself at, you know, at, 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 at an opportunity for harm. That's really, you know, those are concerning um, uh, behaviors. And um, so it's important to pay attention to those. Who is at the greatest risk for um, suicide? You know, it's interesting because uh, a lot of people think that adolescents are at the greatest risk for suicide. And while adolescents are at risk for suicide, the suicide rate is highest, much higher than in any other demographic among um, older adults, so over 60, um, particularly older men over mm. 60. Um, that group has um, suicide rates that are significantly, significantly higher than any other demographic group. And, you know, it's understandable if you take, um, you know, if you think about men who uh, have been working, um, you know, their entire lives, they're of a certain generation and age, um, they retire, uh, maybe they've had losses, they lose their, uh, their social network that's possibly related to work. Um, it's not unusual for alcohol rates to increase um, during that part of your life. And, uh, and so you add the drinking, you add the social isolation, and perhaps depression related to loss. So many losses. So many losses, right. And that group becomes a very high risk. And I think one of the things that medical professionals don't necessarily do so well is screen those adults, those older adults, for suicidality. They have a hard time asking those questions. Mm -hmm. um, are, you, you know, are you suicidal? Do you have thoughts of suicide? That where we circle back, we're right. circling back actually to asking those questions. Right. Oh, um, and we're still a, a society that has trouble bringing those questions forward. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny, a little story. I, I went to see my doctor and uh, the nurse came in and, and she, um, she asked me the question, in, she framed the question in this way, you're not feeling suicidal, are you? And... Hmm. And have you, you know, are you thinking about suicide at all? And I said, um, actually, yeah, I am thinking about suicide. At the time, I was writing a couple of papers on suicide. And the look on her face was just shocked. She couldn't imagine 
you know, okay, so he actually said, yes, he's thinking about suicide. Then what did she do, right? She stopped and she didn't know what to say next. Mm -hmm. um, she didn't really have the training or the, uh, it, was a, it, was a, it was a kind of a toss away question um, mm -hmm. that I think medical professionals often ask. So I did that, I then said, you know, I'm writing these papers, so I'm thinking about suicide all the time. But how you ask the questions, um, you know, how often do you think about suicide? Um, when you're feeling down and depressed, um, what kinds of thoughts do you have? Do you, you know, it's okay to ask people the suicide question um, mm -hmm. and to use that word suicide. What it does is for somebody who's feeling suicidal, it opens up an opportunity for them to have that conversation. And that's really important. Because I think there's also still a lot of shame associated almost in our DNA, you know, uh, about the thought of that. Sure. And for many people from certain religious backgrounds, right. that can be the sin of all sins. Right. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then to, you know, to ask questions about what are the protective factors? You know, if someone is thinking about suicide, what are the things that protect them from that? Religion is one thing. And there are people who would absolutely not commit suicide, even if they're thinking about it, because they know that um, that goes against their beliefs so significantly mm -hmm. that they couldn't do that. Um, are there specific forms of treatment that, that and, and I mean, when I say treatment, what am I saying? I'm saying counseling. I'm saying um, uh, 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 work with um, in a group. Mm -hmm. Are there specific kinds of treatment that work well when someone is experiencing these feelings? So there are lots of different treatments that work well. Talk therapy works really well. Um, cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, you know, being able to understand the thoughts that the person is having and how to be able to um, change those thoughts, to change the experiences that they're having. Is that what cognitive behavioral mm -hmm. therapy, some people call it CBT, is CBT. that what that's really about, sure. is, is thought changing? It's or? helping to change the, the, the thoughts and the schemas that exist for that person. Mm -hmm. um, so, so cognitive behavioral therapy can be very effective in helping treat um, depression and, um, and suicidality. Um, you know, traditional psychodynamic therapy can be very helpful, a relational therapy. Group therapy is incredibly helpful um, mm -hmm. because what happens when um, folks are in a group is that they recognize that there are others who feel similar to them and that can be very helpful. It can allow uh, folks to, to recognize that they're not alone, that the feelings that they're having are, um, are shared by others. And so group therapy can be a very good uh, technique for, for helping with suicidality. Mm -hmm. when, when does, a, when as a clinician, would you feel it was important for someone to be in a hospital? Well, hospitalization is always challenging because you know you, you don't want to have somebody in the hospital. It's you know it can feel restrictive to that person. Um, it, you want to try and do whatever is possible to help treat the person in an outpatient setting. That said, hospitalization is really critical when someone has um, made a serious attempt or they have a very serious plan. Um, and in fact, when they have a plan that they're not sharing with someone, but they're talking about the fact that they have a plan. Um, I've worked with folks in the past who've said, you know, I have a plan, but I'm not gonna tell you what it is. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm not gonna tell you when I'm gonna do it, but I'm telling you that I will kill myself. In those situations, it's really important if you have the relationship with the individual to work with them to get them to recognize that getting into the hospital can be helpful. And a hospital, doesn't treat suicidality necessarily, but what it does is it contains that person and keeps them safe until they can become more stable. That was my next question. How do hospitals take care of people? Right. I mean, hospitals provide containment. They provide a safe and secure environment. Um, they provide staff for relationships, so mental health workers, nurses, doctors, social workers. Uh, that treatment team is really important um, to get them talking about their uh, suicide risk. Um, they are, you know, they're providing group activities and group treatment that can be very helpful in decreasing the suicidal thoughts. And then there's medication that can be helpful. Um, often medication doesn't start working right away. Um, many of the antidepressants take some time to work. And so during that time when you're waiting for the medication to, to really help, uh, the other, those other ancillary forms of therapy can be very helpful and that containment and support. I can imagine it would be very reassuring to have that containment, but also to have a sense of 
of these people are taking me really seriously and yeah. I have an illness. It's not that I'm bad or I have something to be ashamed of, but I have an illness yeah. and they're taking care of me. Right, and, 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 and again, it goes back to stigma. There's so much stigma with mental illness and you know, people really think if I go into the hospital, I'm insane or I'm crazy and that's not true. Uh, if you go into the hospital for um, your untreated diabetes, you have untreated diabetes and you're going to get help for that. Mm -hmm. If you go into the hospital because you have um, you know, a broken leg, um, you're going to get treatment for that. The you know, mental illness is an illness like all other illnesses and there are great treatments for that and sometimes you can take care of those illnesses on, on an outpatient basis and sometimes you have to go into the hospital to get help. How, how can family members help? Well, family members can ask questions. They can ask you know, uh, questions when they see changes in their loved one. They can, uh, you know, if they see an increase in alcohol use or in drug use, if they see a change in um, behavior and an attitude, they can begin to ask questions about that. And what I always suggest to people is that they ask questions directly. Um, and not ask closed-ended questions. Ask open-ended questions. You know, it seems like you're really depressed lately. Um, you know, I've seen you make a lot of changes. Um, you've had a lot of losses. I wonder how often you're thinking about hurting yourself, or I wonder how often you're thinking about committing suicide. And um, and even asking questions about, you know, have you thought about um, hanging yourself? Have you thought about taking an overdose? Have you thought about all of these other um, possibilities? Um, what that does is it opens up that conversation for the person who's feeling like they can't talk about it. It then gives them an opportunity to talk about it. It destigmatizes the subject and it opens up the door for them. Are there other practical things that family members can do? I mean, I'm thinking, for instance, we are in a state, um, and, and I'm not judging whether this is good or bad, but there, but um, a lot of people have guns in their house. Right. Right. I mean, are there things that parent, uh, parents or um, wives or husbands should be making sure the guns are out of the house? Absolutely. I mean, the most lethal method of, of um, suicide, obviously, is uh, use of firearms. Mm -hmm. um, and again, more men um, use firearms to kill themselves than women. Um, women tend to uh, overdose or use asphyxiation, strangulation as a, a means more often. But um, more men kill themselves because they use firearms. And so if you know that there are firearms in the house, if you know that somebody has access to, to weapons like that, um, getting them out of the house is absolutely critical. That can be dicey. It can be a tough conversation with somebody who really wants mm -hmm. their guns in the house. But uh, allowing them to um, give those up, maybe not to the family member, but maybe to somebody else that's trusted, having that person lock those weapons away until we know that that person is safe, and then they can get them back. Um, where can families get help with dealing with a family member who is exhibiting these signs and right. they don't know where to, what to do? Where do they go? Well, you know, I mean, there are lots of resources. Um, there's uh, the 1-800-SUICIDE hotline number, which is really a, 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 it's a national number. Um, they're, they're 24 hours a day, and they can, um, they can certainly give resources for whatever community the person happens to be in. They can be a, a clearinghouse for resources. And they're actually great at talking to people who might be feeling suicidal as well. And they can, they can help them get help immediately. Um, you know, in the schools, the uh, school counselors are well versed in, um, in helping with suicide and knowing where the resources mm -hmm. are in the community. Um, calling the Brattleboro Retreat is a, certainly a, a, you know, a, a, a great option. We have many, many resources available for helping people who are feeling suicidal. Um, and local crisis teams as well. Every, every community has a crisis team that serves them, a mental health crisis team, and calling that uh, crisis team and letting them know that um, you know, you're in pain or you need help or that your family member needs help, those are great ways to, to, to reach out. So what um, if someone commits suicide? Mm -hmm. What do those family members and friends need to understand? Well, I guess the way that I frame it is that, um, you know, mental illness is an illness. And there are degrees of mental illness. And there are um, severities of mental illness. So just like cancer, um, some cancer is treatable and some isn't. 
and some people are going to die of their illness. They're going to die of cancer no matter what treatment is available and no matter what treatment um, is given. Um, you know, mental illness is similar in some ways. And um, I think for me it helps to recognize that I can do everything I can as a family member or as a clinician to provide support and provide treatment for a person who's feeling suicidal. But ultimately, people make the choices that they make, sometimes based on the fact that they're using alcohol and drugs and their judgment is impaired. Sometimes it's just um, you know, a, 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 a situation where somebody acts impulsively. Um, but there's, you know, there's not any sure way that we can prevent people from committing suicide. All we can, be, all we can do is be there to support them, to help them, um, uh, and to hopefully move them away from you know, the, the belief that they are alone and that they are um, uh, you know, a burden um, mm -hmm. to others. And that the only, way to, um, the only way to feel better is to die. And those three things are important. Mm -hmm. People who kill themselves um, feel a burden and they feel alone. And when they have those two senses about themselves and they come to a point where they recognize that dying doesn't scare them, that's a really risky place. And mm -hmm. so we want to we wanna be able to try and do whatever we can to keep people away from that. But we also know that people sometimes get there and they can't get out. Mm -hmm. um, what can friends, of, friends do to support a family? Yeah. that have been going through, have been going through su suicide. My impression is that sometimes, again, it's about talking about it and acknowledging it. And right. what, what is helpful to um, a family that's been through this tragedy? It's so situational. It's so dependent upon the family's culture, their ethnicity, um, their own personal beliefs. Uh, you know, I think family members who've had suicides um, sometimes want to talk about that, and um, and family, uh, f friends, and other family members should be open to talking about that. But there's also you know times when you have to respect that they don't want to believe that the person actually committed suicide, um, and that sort of denial is not unusual, especially early on. Mm -hmm. um, you know, it's interesting in smaller communities around the country, uh, we see rates of suicide may be actually higher than what they're classified because coroners in communities, in small communities, or medical examiners may not actually classify the de cause of death as a suicide. They may, they may um, just check other or unknown. Mm -hmm. um, and that's in some ways to protect the family members who have maybe really feel stigmatized by the, the, the loss as a result of suicide. Mm -hmm. So you have to know the person that you're with, you have to know that family member or friend, and you have to be able to really um, you know, work with them to find out what it is that they need. Mm -hmm. um, and there's certainly um, some great grief counselors and great grief therapy um, programs that can help people survive uh, uh, the feelings around the loss of suicide. And the American Association of Suicidology actually has some great resources on their website. Um, and, uh, and they have groups throughout the country. Um, and, and in fact, in Vermont and in Massachusetts, um, there are groups for people who are survivors of suicide. And those support groups can be very helpful. And our own Brattleboro Center for Health and Learning has been doing a tremendous amount right. throughout the state doing workshops with people, post um, prevention workshops and postvention workshops, which has Absolutely. been great. So how can, uh, speaking of prevention, how do communities, how can they organize themselves to prevent suicide? Well, again, I think it's about having conversations, open conversations, it's, it's talking about it, it's recognizing that it, um, it is um, an epidemic. There are more people in, the, in this country that die from suicides as of 2013 than die of automobile accidents. Wow. So, um, so the CDC recognizes that it, this is an epidemic. Um, we need to have those conversations. We need to be paying attention to what's out on social media um, and mm -hmm. how are um, you know, the youth and adolescents and uh, you know, young people use social media to communicate with each other. Um, and to really recognize that that's a medium both for um, 
you know, for helping prevent suicide, but it also is a, is a medium that people use to talk about their own suicidality mm -hmm. and to talk about their attempts. And so paying attention, monitoring that closely is really important. So when family or friends um, uh, see posts that concern them, they need to, to, they need to respond quickly. Well, I, from everything you're saying, I, it feels like the conversation is so important and yeah. that people need to keep talking right. um, about, uh, about this subject and, um, and to feel the permission that it's more important to start the conversation right. than it is to uh, be silent. Yeah. Anyway, I just want to say thank you so much for oh, joining you, us. And, um, and I really appreciate the time because I know you're a busy person. Um, and I also want to thank Brattleboro Community Television, who help us to produce this program and make it possible for us to reach more people in the community so we can have these important dialogues. Thank you for joining us. And I look forward to seeing you again on another episode of Keep Talking. <laughs>